Summer has arrived earlier than expected in the Bouche de Rhone, and in the forests, the situation is deteriorating. The sun and drought have hit Provence's forests and scrublands with full force. The thermometer is already nearing the 90 degree mark and nature is agonizing. Not a drop of rain for months. A hot and dry spring. The vegetation is ready to ignite into flames. In addition to these highly unfavorable weather conditions, forest fires broke out early in the spring, revealing the blazing power of the vegetation, as well as the presence of incendiary conditions. An arsonist is on the loose, and some pine forests have already paid the price. And this even before the heat wave really hits the region. This season of battling forest fires is going to be complicated. It's only the beginning of the season, and all the warning lights are already red. Exceptional drought, human negligence, only the Mistral's winds would be needed to set everything ablaze. But so far, so good. No wind, dead calm. These precious days of tranquility are used to prepare the troops, and notably one of the most important aspects of the profession driving all-terrain vehicles. The firefighters' fleet includes 330 four-wheel drive vehicles capable of driving on the over 1,000 miles of fire trails in the department. Of different sizes and different functions, they're the first land-based vehicles to access the flame's front line. Some can even drive off-road in three feet of heavy brush. <laughs> The first link in this armada, the lightest, is the VLTT, a light all-terrain vehicle. Built on the base of a Defender 110 Land Rover, this versatile four-wheel drive has been completely modified by the firefighters. Outer and inner reinforcement roll bars, aluminum casing protection, aluminum hood reinforcement, towing hook, beacon, siren, and VHF multi-channel radio link. This scouting vehicle must rely on its road capabilities to guide the rest of the fleet safely towards the combat zone. The second link in the land system, the medium CCFs. Medium volume tank trucks. Built on a Renault M210 truck chassis, the vehicle has been completely remodeled to become a fire attack truck. Four-wheel drive, a traction hoist, a steel tank of over 1,000 gallons, almost 2,000 feet of hose, and a water pump that can provide almost 12,000 gallons at a pressure of 15 bars. The truck is also full of safety features, exterior and interior roll bars, bottles of compressed air for cabin pressure to prevent noxious gases from entering, and above all, an auto protection system creating a bubble of water around the truck. This cloud allows cover for five people during five to seven minutes, just enough to let the blast of a virulent fire pass. The last machine of this armada, is all superlatives. The CCF 13,000 is a forest fire tank truck carrying 13,000 liters of water. A 20-ton attack vehicle that can carry 13,000 liters of water, this impressive Mastodon is built on an eight-wheel drive Mercedes chassis. Its special feature, the two men who drive it never leave the cabin. It fights the flames with a directional water cannon with a range of 230 feet. It hits the flames from far off and its effectiveness is incredible. 
It's also equipped with an auto protection system supplied by a 500 liter tank and an independent electric pump. This is the Rolls-Royce of forest fire fighting vehicles. These vehicles cannot be driven like normal vehicles. Their mastery requires solid training. The forest of roquefort labedoule in the south of the region. This morning, the all-terrain driving training course begins. Every two years, at the beginning of the season, the firefighters must be tested on their driving abilities. First class officers Sebastian Courquin and Robin Schmidt will have to prove to the trainers that they're still able to pilot these machines of fire. The pressure is on. I'm like a kid, a big red truck. It hasn't changed. Like all kids, I dreamt of being a firefighter. I've always wanted to have fire trucks, and that hasn't changed. Now I'm driving them, and it keeps me smiling. Most of the trails we use are intended to be driven on, but we may have to go off-road to reach a fire. That isn't always close to the trail. We have to know how to use our truck and how to get to the fire. When you haven't driven these vehicles since before the winter, it's good to take a look at all the rules again before the season starts in order to drive with more ease later. Mm. This morning, Sebastian opens the operations. What precautions do we take when we first start the vehicle? I put it in gear and release the brake. And? <laughs> My personnel descends from the vehicle to ensure its safety. First difficulty, the slope. It happens when the path is inclined laterally, making the vehicle lean to one side. This is one of the most dangerous traps for a tanker truck. The slightest mistake could cause the truck to roll. So first, go a little slower, as slowly as possible, and to the bottom of the slope. If ever it's slippery, I try to go into the slope to avoid having the truck roll over. Firefighters have developed a method that allows them to know whether the slope is passable or whether they must find another path. This is the most difficult challenge for a driver. You have very limited solutions for getting out of this mess. To evaluate, I go to the worst positions on the slope. I'll be a team member. I'm asked to put myself in a disadvantaged position, from the mark at the level of my knees. I put myself up, I draw a nearly horizontal line from the knee which will join the trail here, and I'll ask my crew to join me in counting the number of steps. We have four steps, so we have more than three steps. Three is not the slope limit for us, which is equivalent to nearly 20% of the maximum slope, so the difficulty will be passable. Less than 20% lateral slope, the truck should pass, but with caution. Because the tank filled with water forms a moving mass which reacts unpredictably to jolts on the path. It can accentuate the imbalance and turn the truck over. The finesse and mastery of the driver will be essential. Truck leans dangerously, but Sebastian's mastery brings him back to safety. The most difficult hurdle is crossed. The rest, a big climb, and a steep bank downhill is a mere detail. Give it a little bit of accelerator. No, not yet. Now it's Robin's turn to take the wheel. His job this summer will be to drive a VLTT, the all-terrain scout vehicle. The challenge is just as great, as the passage of a VLTT assures the passage of the tankers. So driving the lead is a big responsibility, and the trainer must ensure that the young man has what it takes for the position. 
parler un petit peu. So, tell me a little about safety rules for crossing the slope. Okay, for crossing the slope, you put the wheels in the lowest part, a rectilinear path at a constant speed. Okay. If there's any trouble, I turn my wheels in the direction of the slope, I don't brake, and I cross the slope at a constant pace. Okay. okay. The slope's passage is tough, but okay. He still has to cross the slabs and the steps. Go on, accelerate. Two trails that will push the limits of the machine. Robin's reflexes are back, and he passes without a problem. Our young firemen have been commended by their all-terrain mentors. For them, the season can begin. The only downside, they've never faced a real forest fire. Their reaction to the flames remains unknown. A big unknown because as all experienced firefighters know well, you can't truly understand a forest fire until you faced one. The heat, smoke, stress, fatigue, all these parameters greatly influence the firefighters' reactions in action. And even more than that, the first effect of the fire on firefighters who go toward the flames is to hypnotize them. Up till now, the training of these young firemen has been purely theoretical, and their lack of practice is already a real handicap. But until now, the firefighters are still in a grace period. The Mistral has not yet entered the dance. Its winds can stir the embers and blow the flames at 62 miles per hour. Without the Mistral, all is well. It's only when it releases its gusts of wind that disaster happens. Without the Mistral, everything is calm. In the warm air, the maximum alert level is not yet triggered. The vacationers swim without a care. The calm before the storm. But for the firefighters, a palpable apprehension already floats in the air like a burning odor wafting through their thoughts. At the barracks in Aix-en-Provence, the largest in the department, this feeling is more and more present. I think this season will be quite complicated. It'll be very complicated because we realize that over the past few years there have been no major fires. So a large majority of people who will be in the trucks this summer will be people who have not yet experienced a fire. The question is, what will their reaction be? They'll have to be directed, of course. But what will their reaction be facing the flames? How will they work? It should be less calm than last year. So with that in mind, I won't feel very good if it doesn't rain. This bad premonition already present in the barracks also makes its way to the top of the hierarchy. Perched atop a northern area of Marseille, the Codis, the operational center for fire and rescue, is the headquarters of the Red Forces. It's a nerve center where information is transferred, calls, alerts, weather data, availability of staff and equipment conditions. It's from this hyper-connected control tower that Colonel Gregory Elion directs the operations. In the most remote barracks, as at headquarters, the small outbreaks of fire, which have multiplied in recent weeks, causes increasing worry. Can we identify outbreaks of fire-related accidents, or are we focused on key targets at this time? We have fire outbreaks from farm machinery, and we've identified geographic areas where the risk is high. Given the simultaneous outbreaks of fire we have at the moment, and given the spell of drought that we've had since this winter, there's going to be a big job monitoring with the police to try to track down those bothering us now. We have a complex season ahead. We'll have to communicate on the territorial level to sensitize all center chiefs to ensure that the new firefighters understand that summer 2016 will be a summer to mark spirits. A summer to stand as a new reference. We're in a slightly different season from previous years. What concerns me is how dry it is in June already. 
something you'd expect to find in the month of August. This abnormal dryness not only dries out rivers, lakes, and ponds, its main consequence is to gradually transform plants into combustibles. And these combustibles can have different states, which will dramatically impact the start and the force of a fire. Throughout the season, specialists will therefore closely follow the state of the vegetation to refine the level of alert. Mathieu Bonquet, forest fire expert at the ONF, and Vincent Pasteur, expert on forest fires and natural hazards for the Bouche de Rhone, are responsible for monitoring the plant's dryness. Today they have an appointment with the volunteers of the Communal Committee for Forest Fires. Recognizable by their vehicles and their orange uniforms, these experienced volunteers monitor their mountains all year round. They'll review the fire fuel by observing two control plants, rock rose and rosemary. You saw the rosemary, the needles fall away by themselves, completely dry. Here you have all the conditions for fires that degenerate. We're not in a stable phase of plants. How long has it been since you've seen conditions like that? Normally we don't see this until August. It's frightening. The temperature in the sun, I've got 95 degrees. We're close to 30 in Hygro. We have extreme desiccation conditions for accidental fires like cigarette butts. Butts, field work, anything that generates sparks. Yes, sparks. The vegetation here is extremely dried out for late June. Alarming results. The vegetation is so dry that anything could ignite it. A cigarette, a spark. Bad everyday habits have already put the area at risk. Mathieu Bonquet and Vincent Pasteur are now part of a new generation of firefighters, a generation for whom the use of new technologies is important in the fight against fires. This increasingly scientific vision of firefighting reached a new milestone with the recent arrival of drones. Since 2015, these flying machines have invaded the skies of firefighting operations. Reconnaissance, thermal inspection, they're able to go where men cannot go and offer new points of view on destruction from fires. They've become an indispensable asset for the firefighters of the Bouche de Rhone. A new elite group has been created, the Robotic Reconnaissance Team. Their all-terrain vehicle carries a concentrate of technology. We head towards the Alpi Mountains, where our robotic team participates in a major maneuver in the north of the region. Captain Eric Rodriguez is in charge of this squadron. We'll start with the smallest and newest drones to capture images before and after operations to get feedback. This second drone is relatively light. It gives us images during operations. With a classical camera, that can be also combined with a thermal camera. Here we have the drone called the terrestrial robot. It's for chemical, radiological, nuclear and biological operations. And the last is the largest. It can fly for an hour and a half because it's gas-powered. What's special about this one is that it has a gyro-stabilized dual camera that gives us both day and night images. The mission of the day is to help an intervention team which is training in a remote and steep valley. The drone's view should help Captain Nicolas Rabouin to choose the best path for his troops. What would you like to achieve with the drone? Mainly to define the route we're going to use because in this zone there is no obvious trail, so we need to know which route to use. Are there simpler routes to avoid rocky spots to facilitate our path and not fall into a fait accompli? Once that's established, it allows us to monitor if there are leaks, hoses off cut, or particular problems and to survey the operation. Okay, here we go.
L'établissement fait quelle longueur How long is the lot? We're almost 3,000 feet from the water truck to the last nozzle at the end. Okay. Given that up to 3,000 feet, we have visual feedback on the drone. Weighing three pounds, the robotic team's lightest drone is an ideal tool for spotting and investigating, notably thanks to its wide range of action. It can fly one to two miles in distance, as well as a high altitude. But it's not useful up very high because what interests us is generally at ground level. So flying at 500 feet is more than enough. Mission accomplished. The drone permitted the verification of the zone in record time. A time savings which could prove crucial in a forest fire. The drone is the eyes of the commander of operations. The point of robotics is to replace the operational staff, to keep them from taking certain risks and to inform them what they're getting into. For the robotic reconnaissance team, this day marks the end of their training. Drivers and machines are now nearing the operational phases. Further south in the department, other firefighters are preparing for a final training. These late trainings allow the troops to work in weather conditions much like those they'll encounter later. Blazing sunlight, upwards of 86 degrees on the thermometer. In addition to verifying the troops' physical condition, these late season maneuvers are used to make a final equipment inventory and above all to complete the young recruit's training. This training is for a particular group of firefighter, the DIH, the Helicopter Intervention Detachment. The mission of the DIH, to bring water to the most remote areas, the steepest corners of the Massif, to fight fire where all other means have become ineffective. To do so, they employ two completely different methods. The first, carrying a line of hose and pumps on the backs of men. The second, using a helicopter to bring men, material, and water to the most inaccessible areas. The DIH intervenes in the heart of the underbrush, on the summit of cliffs, at the bottom of deep ravines, anywhere trucks cannot gain access. The first day is devoted to method one, the most physical, the most demanding, carrying materials on men's backs. The goal of the exercise, to pump water from the Econo River up to the top of Beauradon at 1,500 feet in altitude. To do so, they must unroll almost 2,000 feet of hose, position three relay pumps, route gasoline, valves, and propel water with a minimum pressure of six bars to the top of the rock. It's very hot out and the exercise promises to be difficult. The training officers welcome graduates Guillaume and Regis. They're supervised by Commander Fabrice Mosse. Come on, guys, slowly, slowly. Guillaume and Regis are the brains of the exercise. They must establish the operations line, choose the location of the pumps and the length of intervals in the hose, a real headache with the IGN map in the background. Do it by the number of hoses. You have to know how many. Do the math. Six hoses of 140? Exactly. Meanwhile, the young recruits become familiar with the very specific DIH equipment and, in particular, with a source of much pain to come, the carrying rack. This is the carrying rack here, above four hoses of 65 feet for a total of 260 feet. The forest fire division. And we have what we call the attack key, the 45 nozzle. Comfortable. At the base of the line, the all-terrain truck and oversized pump will ensure the initial propulsion, 317 gallons of water per minute with 15 bars of pressure. We need water permanence. If we don't have water permanence, it's not worth going a mile from the base. If you don't have water at the top, you'll be angry with the guy at the base. So that's the way to have water permanence. You can draw almost one mile of 70 hose. It's good. The second solution, 
is the hose cart. This, there are different ways to use it. Either by helicopter, rolls flown up, you'll see that tomorrow, or either we carry the hoses. And to carry the hoses, we created straps. Lean into it. Second-class firefighter Bastien Merrill and his comrade Corporal Robin Schmidt take their first steps in the Brotherhood of DIH. It's a true endurance test. Each hose is 33 pounds and the racks, the biggest rack with the pump, is 77 pounds. For us, it's okay. We're lucky. We're the first to put them in place. But then we relay with our colleagues, helping them to carry the racks. The plan of attack is ready. Let the trial begin. An experienced firefighter and a natural leader, Robert Mugeli is the godfather of the DIH family. Uncle, as his men like to call him, is one of the great masters of the art of DIH in the Bouche de Rhone. After when we get up there, you'll see it's not the same story, because you'll reach the foot of the rocky ridge and you'll go around the rocky ridge to get out. Solidarity is a fundamental value in the DIH. Come on, move forward! And very quickly as they climb, it's expressed by Fabrice Mosset. <laughs> oh, how you've pampered! There's nothing there? Oh, it's because you're a commander. You've changed. <laughs> All firefighters are proud. In my case, they took my carrying rack, but I didn't ask for that. Not at all. It's not favoritism, it's helping each other out. But on the other hand, when you have a mission, you generally take it to the end. Still, this time, it took three of them to take it from me, plus the chief. <laughs> Relay pump number one, operational. We have water in the division. We're continuing. Relay pump number two, operational. Three quarters of the way up they break to install the third pump. This is the last relay before the summit. The men are wearing out and helping each other is essential. You told me to come on up, I'm coming up. Set your idol properly, enter with a low bar. Everything is verified by ear and by foot. You feel the pressure in the pipes to know where you are in terms of the water pressure inside the pipes. When you feel that it's soft, you have to rebalance the pressure to achieve the needed six, seven or eight bars. There must be about 165 feet to the top, so five bars maximum. We'll get that with this pump. So the calculation was well done by the group leader. After two hours of effort, the scouts, led by William, the group leader, arrive at the base of the summit. It's the moment for the last test before the summit. Let's give it a try. Don't move, guys. Wait. Regis from Guillaume. Is the water coming? No. Regis from Guillaume, can you open the division? We connected a fire hose for pressure testing. I'm going to give it the maximum, but normally it's at 30 to 10 bars. The intermediate pump that is supposed to take water from the stream broke down. It happens. Those are operational risks. After we find a solution to pump the water properly, 
No, that would just be unlucky if everything broke down. I'm not saying it can't happen, but we made sure to maintain the equipment so that it doesn't happen. After if one breaks down, it happens. <laughs> Gotta change the pump. Marco, they're bringing you up one? I think if the fire hose is stuck, it's a piston problem. It's not that the fire hose is blocked, the piston is blocked. We gotta go back down. We'll replace the bad pump. We'll see what time it arrives. When you arrive down there, tell me where you are. We'll see how much time you need to descend, Dudu. <laughs> That's not why. Just to get an idea. The pump is changed, but still nothing. The troops at the summit don't have water. From atop the rock, Robert tries a final diagnostic with the teams that stayed below. Don't hesitate to hit on the division. Armed with a simple walkie-talkie, he'll find the origin of the blockage. A valve cover for the safety valve is stuck. Finally, after 15 minutes, water arrives at the top of the summit with an excellent pressure level. Mission accomplished for the men of the DIH. Listen, all of you. You see the problem we have here? It's simply because a division was blocked. The check valve often gets stuck, and so the water doesn't rise. So the best is to take the division and give it a good tap on the ground to deblock the valve. The water normally should have come up. We stopped the progression so that the water could arrive, the time that the pump was changed. But it could well happen during an intervention. That's why we train. Here we're learning, but on a response call, we halt the progression and change the pump. We wait till the water comes to the firefighters to be safe. Above all, the guys must understand that they must not come up without water. For Robin and Bastien, this DIH initiation is a success. An exercise full of instruction. We have to pace our efforts so we don't arrive too tired and endanger ourselves, because we don't have the necessary resources behind us anymore. It's the training throughout the year that makes it possible for us to climb today. For the trainees, the 360-degree view offered by the Bau Redon is ideal for learning about the geography from Robert Mojali. Here you have the Pic de Bertaine, the famous 525-foot cliff that falls there. It's the highest point of the Bouche du Rhône. The part down there should be defended by Géminos, but for accessibility, it's Plan d'Op or the Val which rises. It's magnificent. Especially for someone coming from Évreux. <laughs> We're experienced at working in extremely steep environments. And what I would qualify as a bonus is the state of mind from the old days when we still pulled the hoses. For inexperienced trainees, this is an opportunity to get acquainted with an essential know-how, how to use the nozzle. Actually, by operating the nozzle, we can control our stream. If, for example, we see that the fire is coming in a bit strong, which may be a bit violent, we can protect ourselves. Him over there, he really has a solid stream, so he can go further into the heart of the fire. We must rely on people who have experience with fires, and especially the older ones, who've battled big fires, since it's been a few years since we've had a fire. They explain to us, you'll see, the fire is like this or like that. That's good. There have been deaths, we're aware of it, and it's a bit of our duty to find solutions to overcome this and avoid all these risks. And now's the fun part. We'll put things away. We'll put away the almost 200 feet of hose. Like I was saying earlier, it's a state of mind, like Lieutenant Colonel Fonterres, who was the first to roll the hoses, leading by example. We're all on the same mission, to go up as well as down. Everyone participates, and it contributes to the group's mood and cohesion. That's what grabs you. Okay, let's go. Be careful going down. It's the most dangerous. So keep your footholds, watch your step, and see you later. Ah. 
Commander, the colonel rolled his better than you. You'll see, I'll catch up. We climbed up, put out the fire, now we put things away. Back at the bottom, we're tuckered out. The turtle and the hare, there's no point in running. <sighs> now it's time for the second exercise, installing 1.2 miles of hose that will take our trainees into the thick of night. <laughs> 2 a.m., the effort is over, time to rest. Because tomorrow will be just as physical. <laughs> the morning sun that wakes up the troops already announces another hot day. A last moment of rest before getting back into action. This second day of training is devoted to the other aspect of DIH, setting up a hose line with an overpowering machine. No, not that one there. This one. An HBE for Bombardier Water Helicopter. A Squirrel Helicopter. Airbus Model AS350. Handy, powerful, versatile. The ideal tool to help the men of DIH get to the most remote places. For many trainees, this is their first encounter with a helicopter. And for some, it's the fulfillment of a dream. It's my first time. This is the first time I see a helicopter so close up. Here comes the exciting part. Well, it's pretty exciting, and it's a change from what we usually do. It's the helicopter that motivated me to do this specialty. Yeah, my dream is to fly. But first, our young recruits will have to learn the basics of working around a helicopter. Positioning. Safety instructions, hooking up, attitude on board, every detail counts because with a helicopter, danger is everywhere. Etienne Duprat is one of the three pilots recruited for the summer. This is his first season fighting forest fires. In the DIH, education is very important. So the dangerous parts of the helicopter are the two rotors, the main and the tail rotor. A general rule for approaching a helicopter, always approach a helicopter from the side or the front. But there's a little nuance. You have to pay attention to the slope too. The slope or the incline of the ground relative to the helicopter may be a source of danger on the heliport. Three to five feet is all the difference for the rotor to reach you at arm's height or even hit you in the head. Accidents have happened many times. For his part, Robert is in charge of training and ground teams. The young recruits will have to do guiding and hanging work. And again, any inaccuracy could be fraught with consequences. It's important, it's imperative that you see the pilot. The pilot is always on the right. English driving is on the right. The person who is next to him on his left side is the HBE, and who in addition increases guiding by opening the door and working from the outside. When you go to receive the aircraft, you'll show him that you're there. You come to me, it's like that. I want to make him go there, and so I give him the direction and I give him the movement. I want to go back, I stabilize it. I want it to go up, I stabilize it. He does what you ask. A simple one with a capacity of 200 gallons. So I'll make a general reminder. When the Bambi arrives, it's often in the basket on the side will help the pilot and the HBE to take it down. The Bambi is not in work position. In order for it to work, it's necessary to arm the Baleines like this. Now it's in working position. Come with me and we'll go under the helicopter. Watch for antennas and the cable cutter in front. We'll position it, hook it up and check it. And after you release the load, OK? OK. Ground training is complete. The exercise can begin. The goal of the operation? Use the helicopter to take up to the summit 12 men, two water pumps, and a water tank for 500 gallons of water.
The tank is in place, but unstable. The summit team is forced to move it. Apparently you've moved the tank and the helicopter may have trouble picking it up. We didn't move it much. It, it was here. Now it's a little lower. Now that everything is near, Etienne the pilot will tackle the most dangerous phase of the maneuver. Unwind the main hose that will connect the men from the summit to the tank near the heliport. All good, clear out. But the hose has become obstructed, which could imbalance the device. Pull, pull! Evacuate the hose! Disconnect! Get rid of this one! Come on, we'll go up! Bring this one up there! Bring it up! Robert immediately had the right reflex and releases the device. The danger is eliminated, and the pipe perfectly unrolled. It's now that Bambi comes into play. This water bag hung under the helicopter. A tool so important in the fight against forest fires that Etienne must handle it as much as possible before the real fires start. For today, he must succeed in filling the 500-gallon tank that stayed at the summit as quickly as possible. For the last rotation, Robert decides to add a difficulty, filling Bambi with the pump of a truck. A delicate maneuver, especially for the ground crews, but a maneuver that can be extremely useful in case of absence of a water source during a fire. So that Etienne the pilot can take advantage of this day to work his reflexes and precision, the maneuver ends with him dropping his water load. On the heliport, it's time to debrief. Errors made today must not happen again during a real fire. The Bambi was there and you advanced the nose a bit and the cable cutter lifted one of Bambi's chains. When you went up, it broke. That's why I approached you, because I saw the situation coming. If he's stuck, I'll go pull on the jump. I know it won't move. It's not dangerous, but it took the chain here and after it came down. The problem is that the Bambi is really close to the helicopter. For the security in this zone, people are walking around, even you, and you all have the same objective. One time I had you guiding, and after I put you there. Also, the wind started turning. It turned while you were flying? Okay. After that, we have to limit the movement of staff circulating in the zone, especially since you saw when we maneuvered. I put myself on the side and the guys were below. If you have a loss of power, you may slice someone. But we know it's like that. The men's training is essential, but the DIH way is that it always happens in a good atmosphere, and the misadventures of the past often make the best anecdotes. I have a friend who is the head of the Castellet base. He's number two in Toulon. And one day he arrives on a mission, he gets off the helicopter and whoops, his butt is naked. Because in the bell, by the force of being shaken in the seats, it accelerated the wear of his suit. In going down after they had finished mission, they descend, poof, naked butt, in full mission since he was not at the base. After they used pilot suits, not firefighter suits, with elbows, knees, and it was better. 
plus sensible renforcé. Et là, ça allait mieux. Quoi. For the young recruits, their first helicopter experience was full of emotion and learning. The pilot, frankly, I was looking, I was right behind him. It's amazing. And he was not old. Frankly, he did not look old. Yeah, he was on top of it. Here he was on a flat surface, so we came back quite serene. But at the top, we landed. He took off again. And as soon as we start to go down, we see the helicopter leave a little like that. So we quickly see the limits of the machine and it's cool. So in fact, we just have to trust the pilot and we follow. And unfortunately today, we didn't do a lot of flying. We maybe did a minute in total. We really liked it, but it's true that the takeoff time is fast and that the helicopter makes a small rotation and then it lands. We don't really have much time, but still enough to enjoy it. We can't wait to go up again. In terms of speed and efficiency, for us there's no comparison. It's much easier with the helicopter. The day ends. It's time for the helicopter to return to its base, where it will immediately cover a red alert forest fire. Now with a solid experience of working in the most inhospitable places of the region, the DIH team is ready to face the worst and defend tooth and nail every tree of the huge Bouche de Rhone forest.